and welcome to GM Tips. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master on Fury's Reach. Today's theme is keeping pace. Most of the questions I've received from the hashtag Ask Satine are how to get players to do a thing during the story to keep it moving. The honest answer is, slow pacing isn't just the player's fault, it's part Game Master too. Let's look at some of the things that slow down a game on the player's side of the table. Metagaming. Rather than making a decision based on your character and their interactions, you and your fellow players look at each other's sheets, make out of character suggestions to players during their turn, use knowledge from outside of the game to influence the decisions of your character or your fellow player's character choices. In-game indecision. The fear of making the wrong choice in the story or worry that your choice might upset the other players. Not knowing your character. Not knowing your abilities, powers, spells. Not knowing where items are on your character sheet. Not remembering all the actions you can take until halfway into someone else's turn. Not paying attention to what the players are doing around you. You're so busy with your character, you're not paying attention to what your fellow players have done since your last turn, even though it could affect what you do next. On your phone, chatting via text, Twitter, answering work emails. This prevents you from being present, and it's only okay if you discuss why you need to be doing this with your group ahead of time. Not hearing what the Game Master has explained. Maybe this is because another player was whispering something to you, or you were on your phone, or trying to figure out what your powers do. Now let's look at some of the things that could slow down a game from the GM side of the screen. Generally, being unprepared. Having to look up bad guy stats, having to look up locations, having to tell players what their character's abilities are and how they work. Having to walk players through things they can do during an encounter. Setting up or drawing maps, not having minis prepared ahead of time. Remember, some of these things can't be helped. I'm just pointing out the culprits. As the Game Master, there are a few things you can do to help your players be more prepared. Let them know ahead of time what you expect from them. This pre-game speech will resolve a lot of pacing issues. Sometimes the players don't know what's okay and what's not okay at the table. So tell them all, as a collective, what you expect and answer questions up front. There are three major issues that need to be addressed up front. Metagaming. No metagaming or light metagaming or no metagaming, but Bobby, can you help Sally? Because she's new and only for today's game. Phones at the table. No phones at the table ever or no phones at the table unless you're using it as your player's handbook. Here's a big one. Don't interrupt the game master. When you interrupt the game master, you might lose information they thoughtfully put together or make the GM lose track of items that might have helped you. Making a GM repeat themselves is incredibly frustrating. As a player, I raise my hand when I want to ask the GM a question, or if a group of players seems to be losing their way and discussing things loudly, and I want a chance to be heard, but I'm not good at being loud enough to break into groups aggressive discussion. Asking my players to do this ahead of time allows even the quietest of players to feel that they can be heard. Here are things that you as a GM can do behind the scenes to prepare the game's pace before the game starts. Prepare! If you present a bad guy or monster to the group, have their stats ready to go either in printout or in a tab in your book. Characters don't randomly wander into the next town or village. You know the area they're in and what surrounds it. Make sure you write down what these locations are and what kind of folk they contain. You don't have to over-prepare details. You can improv your way through NPCs and some shops, but know the land you're in. Keep a timer or clock. Pre-plan when events should hit during the game, and no matter what, stick to them within 10 minutes. Pre-draw maps, pre-pick minis, pre-name NPCs, or have books on hand that'll assist. Here's one. Test your adventure. Not many people have the time to do this, but if you test your session on a different group ahead of time, you get to find out where the session's weaknesses and timing issues are before you get to your main group. Here are some things that you can do with the players to prepare them so that they have what they need to keep the game moving. Long-term game player help. Assist your player in building their characters and their character backstories. Walk them through where items are on their page and most used parts of the sheet, HP, AC, saving throws, skills, weapons, etc. Color code things for them if it gets confusing. 
Only lately have I seen character sheets where human factors have been a part of its design. Find designs that work best for your player. The more they're prepared and connected to their character's details, the faster their decisions of what to do in any given situation are. Short-term game player help. Walk them through pre-made characters. If you give people pre-made characters, find a way to simplify the information so they only use what's needed. In a one-shot, they can make up their own backstory or use a sentence to quickly convey the kind of person the character is. Highlight the main abilities. Make things easy to read. One-shots are usually only a couple hours, so it's better to get the information across to the player as fast as possible so they don't spend the little hours they do have to play overwhelmed with 100 abilities. Player Cheat Sheet. Give them a sheet that quickly tells them what they can do. It can be a flashcard. Think of things people ask the GM for. How far can things move? What's advantage? What happens when you're prone? What actions can I take on my turn? Making sure you and your players are prepared ahead of time are just two of the many ways you can keep your game moving forward. I could roll on, but let's talk to Stephen Chenault, the man behind Troll Lord Games and Castles and Crusades. Stephen, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. We are talking about ways to keep pace. You have a lot of ways to keep pace. I know you from all of the convention games, right. and you were pretty amazing at keeping the game moving even though you don't know any of the players. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And even if I have 25-odd people at the table, I think it's my biggest game is 25 people that I've had in there. That's cool. And, and I try to keep the pace going all the time. But you actually design that into your games, right? Generally speaking, the first thing I do is I kind of avoid dungeons when I'm running most con games, because it's harder to keep pace in dungeons. Uh, but in environments, you know, outdoors, mountains, what have you, pace is much, much easier. And it, if you get your pace right, you can engage all the players around the table all the time and keep them engaged. Yeah, can you is, explain that a little bit? Well, you know, one of the things I do, any kind of environment can be challenging, whether you're climbing a cliff, going up or down, whether you're uh, lost in the woods, crossing a river, you know, whatever it is. And because environment changes so quickly when you're moving, you can be in a flat, you know, prairie for a little bit, and then a few minutes later, you're at a gulch that you gotta go down. And then there's a, a creek at the bottom of the gulch. It's got, you know, the headwaters of a spring in it. So there's so many things that you can do so very, very fast. If the game slows, you can change your terrain, because at the end of the day, they don't know what's beyond that hedgerow. And you can just make it up. That's true. So how do you, keep pace with, in the environment, for the different kinds of players that you have? Well, that, that's, it gets a little bit more challenging, and it's easiest to do, well, I shouldn't say easiest, it's more complicated, but easy to do with monsters. Mm -hmm. Because then you can get into the, uh, all the action and the, the blood and the, the grids of it. But it's better to do it with terrain, because you can control the terrain so very, very much. Uh, if they're slipping down the cliff face, there's a root system they can grab. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do. If you're aware of terrain a little bit, if you've been out hiking or anything, you know how, what's out there, and you can just keep throwing that at them time and time again. And pretty much anyone, whether they're heavy role players or heavy mechanics guys or whatever it is, will either have to react or they will react to the terrain. Whereas if you're doing monsters, it may not, you know, they may not, I, I, I can't fight this monster, I don't have the ability. Yeah. But if you're going down the cliff, you gotta go down the cliff. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're a paladin or a thief, it doesn't matter. Well, how do you make it so they don't feel ra railroaded? Well, that's kind of the, uh, the other nice thing about terrain. Because they don't know what's going on beyond that hedgerow, you can just change it as you go. And they really don't know. Uh, and if you use keywords, um, like I've, I'm always, we did a book called uh, Gary Gygax's World Builder years and years ago. Fantastic book, and it's just filled with lists of stuff that Gary and, and a fellow named Dan Cross had put together. And it's just filled with so much information about tree types and bushes types and just, <laughs> just anything. And if you're, if you're describing something and you say the aspen tree is on the other side of the hedgerow, no one knows what an aspen tree looks like, but they envision something in their head. So that mm -hmm. it kind of engages them, you know, immediately to go into that. So terrain just gives you all of these opportunities to, to engage just about anybody very, very quickly. So some characters take to it really easily, but some are, have that weird indecision freeze up thing that happens. How do you handle those kind of players in a game where the environment kind of moves things along? That's tricky because um, you don't want to put them in a situation that they can't get out of, you know, regardless. And so the, the knee-jerk reaction is to have the terrain change 
quickly beneath them, the cliff begins to give way. The water starts to rise, you know, whatever. So they have to do something. But once you've done that, you've committed yourself on a path of, yeah. <laughs> of possibly killing the character. Because <laughs> if, they, if they stay indecis indecisive, they're going to slide down the cliff, you know, and, and die. But um, generally speaking, when I'm trying to, to engage them without overdoing it, uh, I soften the terrain a little bit. If you slide down the cliff, you can see there's mud down there. You may or you may not hit it. What do you do? You know, that type of thing. You just change it a little bit, and that's the joy of terrain is you can change it. So long as they don't know what's in front of them, you can change it very, very fast. And they're not going to know they're being railroaded because they don't know. They don't know what's coming ahead. Here's a question. How do you keep pace without leaving people out? Some characters are quiet and maybe aren't making a lot of decisions and other characters are kind of taking the reins and moving things along. Uh, and that's gonna happen in any game you run. You're, someone's going to take charge. It just always is the way it is. And what I try to do, and, and this is again where pacing becomes so important, I try to do rapid rounds. So that when I'm going around the table, and I'll always start on my right-hand side, so everybody knows how I'm, how I'm gonna run the game. I start here. I don't linger on any one person. Even the person who's, like I've got a guy at the table every time. He takes charge. He doesn't <laughs> want to, but he just, <laughs> he just naturally does. But I, I just, I shoot through him, what do you do? He tells me what, it, and I go to the next one. I don't give him time to pontificate, or, and he appreciates that, because he wants everyone, you know, engaged. So if you're going fast, those people who don't really want or a little nervous or shy or whatever the case may be, they, uh, they don't feel put upon because it's fast. They're in and out, you know, and they're done. And that helps, I think, a lot in engaging those people without overly engaging them and, and spooking them from the whole game. Yeah. yeah, I've noticed that a lot of people have been getting, uh, they're so indecisive that I'm having to just say, well, you took too long, now we're skipping your turn. And I kind of feel rude for doing it, but at the same time, because they're taking so long during their action, it's rude to everybody else. Because right. you know, then they're waiting and it also slows down the entire game. How do you do it so you don't feel rude? <laughs> well, I got two things. At, at a con game, I'll tell people quite jokingly. Now, my regulars know this is the way I game. If, if I'm doing lightning actions, you know, very, very fast rounds, I got a five second rule and I'll do this <laughs> because, and, and I'll explain in the beginning, some of these encounters are, you know, it's all built around what's happening right now. So I want instantaneous reactions. Some of our classes are even built that way. You can't use your ability if you don't react instantly. Oh, yeah. So I'll do this, I'll let everybody know this is, so if you see my hand coming up, you're slowing too much, but I always do it as a joke, you know, joking around. But then when you're rapid rounding and someone sees me doing this, they, you know, invariably they'll say something, whether it's, you know, uh, I, successful or not. I hold, I hold my oh, action. Yes, that's actually <laughs> frequently what they do, which is, just, and I, oh, it's a legitimate action. Great, you're holding for this round, go to the next guy. Okay. Don't, it's too easy to say, is that really, you really want to hold? You don't want to cast the spell? You don't want to do any of that. Don't so that's ever. actually a dungeon master issue right there. Yes, absolutely. Like almost catering to and convincing Metagaming. It sort of is. That is kind of metagaming. It sort of <laughs> is. It, it, and I, it, I cater to players a lot in that in that regard, but I don't ever single them out. Ever do I. You're being too slow. You're being too indecisive. Never would I do that. Because everyone's there to play. And yeah. once you start singling people out, then they get self-conscious, right. and then they're not having fun, and the whole point is that we're there to have fun. That's the key to the, <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing is to have fun. And you don't want to make someone uncomfortable. and all. You don't want to do any of that. And that's, either, that's always going to go bad. They're either going to stop playing, and it's going to get worse, or they're going to get mad, and it's going yeah. to get a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. So there's just no good end of calling someone out for doing it. Absolutely. And if they don't do anything, you just roll to the next person and just, okay, got it. You know, you don't, you just don't single them out. Let's talk a little bit about uh, bringing players back and how to engage them. Uh, now if you've lost someone, it's tough because once they start going down that road, it, it can get bad, you know, with the phones and all of the business. So generally what I try to do is break my stride. Uh, I'll be over here talking to this person. And I'll immediately pivot mid-sentence and say, okay, the, the, grain, the terrain starts falling out beneath you or the river starts swelling, what do you do? And then that person's, they're caught off guard, but they want to react. The phone's going to go down and they, I make a dex check, you know, whatever, they, whatever they're doing. I do this, I try to do this. And, and then everyone can, else jumps up because and, they're engaged too. Right, and, then so, and, and they're also wondering why are we 
out of order. Why, why is there, why is chaos suddenly entered the game? Yeah. Uh, and it really does engage everybody. And it, and it doesn't matter if something's actually happening. I will have people make attribute checks for nothing. <laughs> they will be sitting there just sitting there and I'll go, hey, give me a dex check. What? 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 And then they're sitting there waiting and there's nothing going on. <laughs> there's absolutely nothing going on back there. <laughs> just, just so they're doing That's something. Really <laughs> it's the joy of dice. They love rolling dice. I love rolling dice. We all love rolling dice. And so. then they pay attention because mm -hmm. it, they're waiting to like, oh, what is, and everyone else is like, why did they make that check? Yep. What is happening? And you're just sitting back. He didn't say anything. Is there something good? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and you, another thing you can do to actually prepare for that is I'll frequently have everybody make checks, a wisdom check, before the game starts. Everybody give me a wisdom check. Oh. Add all your stuff to it, and I'll write it down. And then later I'll say, what was that wisdom check you made at the beginning of the game? And they're like, uh, 14. Oh, yeah. It doesn't mean uh, anything. And then pretend to write something down. <laughs> right. It doesn't mean anything. So, but uh. it engages them. It makes them think, oh, there's a bigger picture going on here. There's something happening here. What is your pre-game house rule? Uh, well, beside the five, when I hold up my hand thing, generally speaking, I tell players whether I'm at a convention, and my local gamers know it, that anything goes. I don't want people to think, I don't have this ability, I can't try something. Try anything. And I'm gonna have you make an attribute check. Whether you succeed or not, that's a whole different discussion, but try anything. That's, that's generally my, my go-to rule. I know you've gamed it for a really long time. What is your favorite GM moment? I was at a con in Carbondale, Illinois, and there was these two brothers, and they were young at the time. I've known these guys so long, they have since joined the Army served in Iraq and come back. Oh, wow. I mean, so these, these two young guys were had a river, my river crossing, that thing that I do, and um, they couldn't get across the river, and they were two dwarves, so what they did is they cut a tree down, and they limbed it, and they put all of the other players on the tree. Now, they both have plate mail and chain, and they tied themselves together, and they hung themselves over the tree as ballast to keep the tree. <laughs> That's which, awesome. There's no way. And, there's just no way. But I had to make a bunch of attribute checks and survive and get across the river because it was so cool. <laughs> it was just so awesome watching these two knuckleheads. Just, I mean, it was it was so funny. That has to be one of my, my favorite GM moments, without a doubt. Quick tip to the audience. Uh, you, you know, it goes back to what we're talking about. Just keep your pacing. If you keep, if you keep everybody engaged, I think you'll keep your table pretty happy because people want to be there to game. And like you said, they want to have fun. And they're not having fun if they're just sitting there Listening to someone else or listening to you drone on about some village's history. Of yeah. <laughs> it's cool to you, but they yeah. don't know what you're talking about. So, And that is our show for today. Thank you all for joining us here on Geek and Sundry. Thank you, Steve, for coming all the way out to L.A. to join us. Thank you for having me. Where can we find you on the Internet? www.trollord, no, it's www.trollord.com. And from there you can find all of this, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and all of that stuff. And other books? Uh, Castles and Crusades, Amazing Adventures, Victorious. You can find all of that stuff from that portal. It'll get you everywhere you want to be. Fantastic. I'm Satine Phoenix. You can find me at Satine Phoenix. You can catch me every Sunday on twitch.tv slash Arcana in Orphan Echo. And Tuesday is Dungeon Mastering Fury's Reach on twitch.tv slash dnd. And on Sagas of Sundry Dread on projectalpha.com. Steven, will you GM us out of here? You've come to a river. It's the Powder River, you've been here a dozen times. You know the bridge spans the river, but you also know it's the rainy season. Water's up, the apex of the bridge, you can see it, it's halfway across the river, but it's gonna be a dangerous trip. No reason to cross the river, right? Just wait, it'll go down in a few days. But on the other side, you see a mule. It's got a rope hanging from its halter, it's got some packs on its back, but there's no owner in sight. Clearly beyond that, you hear the noise, of something coming through the woods. What is it you do? I hide. You hide, if you hide, whatever comes through those, those woods is going to get the mule. I wait. Slowly you see the woods part, a large giant comes out. It's a hill giant, he's looking around, clearly looking for something to eat. What is it you do? I wait. <laughs> he crosses the road. He sees the mule. The mule brays. It's clearly scared. It starts to run. His tether gets hung up in some roots. It's hung. It starts pulling. It's trying to pull itself away. The giant smiles, starts walking in that direction. Are you going to cross the river? 
No way, man! <laughs> the mule dies and feeds the giant. <laughs> I didn't die. <laughs> you survived. But the poor mule. 